I've developed an approach to in working with intercultural conflict transformation and uh, healing uh, collective and uh, historical trauma, which I call healing the wounds of history. Um, and it's uh, it originally was um, entitled um, Acts of Reconciliation. And um, yeah, it's a it's a process where theater techniques are used to work with a group of participants uh, from two cultures with a common legacy of conflict uh, and historical trauma, or focusing on on one group that uh, carries a legacy. Um, I've worked with uh, descendants of Holocaust survivors and Nazis. Uh, Palestinians and Israelis, uh, which uh, we called mapping the emotional terrain of peace. Um, Japanese and Chinese, for example, on their legacy, World War II and the Nanjing massacre. Um, Armenians and Turks, uh, Turks and Kurds, Bosnians and Muslims. Uh, Serbs and Albanians in Kosovo, uh, Blacks and Jews, uh, Indigenous Canadians and the descendants of white settlers. Uh, so there's no shortage of uh, trauma to work with. Um, the work takes uh, different forms. Uh, one is a workshop that focuses on a single trauma and it's impact on a group of people or nation. Um, a more general workshop open to persons of diverse cultures who wish to explore their legacy of historical trauma. Um, therapeutic sessions with an individual couple or family for whom historical trauma is a defining event. A uh, process lasting several days, bringing together participants from two cultures with a shared legacy of conflict and trauma. So uh, working over several days with two, uh, two cultures. Um, a playback theater performance that follows such an intensive workshop in which participants and audience members, volunteers share personal stories related to the historical trauma in question. I'll be showing you some clips a little bit later to give you a little taste of what it, what it looks like. Um, and also um, in the drama therapy field, uh, we developed uh, an approach to using performance as a therapeutic act, uh, which we call autobiographical therapeutic performance. Um, so these are the, the, the different forms that this work uh, might uh, take shape. Um, and I think some of the, the principles involved, um, uh, theoretically speaking, uh, you know, are the, the um, development of uh, the idea of a transgenerational transmission of trauma. Um, I started uh, working with this theme in 19, the mid 70s. Um, the negative effects on cultural and national identity and self esteem. Um, the um, another uh, theme is um, exploring and owning the potential perpetrator in in all of us. Um, and then the, the basic uh, stance, uh, my stance is that there could be no permanent political solutions to intercultural conflict without re respect for the needs, emotions, and unconscious, unconscious drives of the human being. Um, in terms of some of the therapeutic goals that uh, we keep in mind as we work with people, one is uh, recognizing and deconstructing cultural or 
national identity, uh, which I'll show you an example of in a moment. Um, intercultural conflict resolution and teaching intercultural communication is another goal. Um, more often than not in this work, there is a, we tap into a personal and collective grief and mourning and giving giving space to that. Um, and um, creating a culture of empathy. And uh, um, Viktor Frankl's idea of creating meaning out of suffering. So that's kind of uh, of uh, an overview on um, going in and working with these uh, these groups. What what I keep in mind, or as I apply my tools, um, there are different. I've found that there are different phases to this work. Um, that the first one um, is uh, breaking the taboo against uh, speaking to each other. Usually there is some injunction about enemies speaking to each other. And so uh, both in the recruitment of participants and um, you know, uh, there's an earning of trust and the, the idea of emotional pioneers, that I work with the emotional pioneers paving the way for others to follow. That, um, and uh, so we can talk more about that later. Uh, there is uh, a, a phase of humanizing each other through telling our stories. Uh, that's a big principle uh, in this work. Um, against exploring and owning the potential perpetrator in all of us, moving deeply into grief, um, and then ultimately creating integration uh, performances or, or rituals of remembrance. Uh, and uh, lastly, making commitments to acts of, acts of creation and acts of service. Um, Okay, so that's kind of an over, overview, a quick overview. Um, I would like to, um, um, I'm going to pour out a, a lot of different uh, things and show you clips to see what uh, the work uh, looks like. And then I'll leave some time for questions um, at the, towards the end. Um, so I'm going to do an exercise right now uh, based on the uh, tension of me being new. And this is, um, you don't uh, uh, know me. And I'm, I'm going to um, deconstruct my identity or my identities in front of the group. And this is an exercise that we do when we gather um, uh, groups that carry legacies of historical trauma and uh, groups in, in conflict. It's a deconstruction of identity. And so I'm going to say uh, my various identities and and then uh, report on what comes up for me in this moment as I say them, okay? And so, for example, um, my name is Arman Volkas, and I am a Jew. So when I say I am a Jew, um, it feels, I feel like a target uh, because in my ears, I, I hear dirty Jew. And although, you know, it's unlikely uh, that in um, a room full, a Zoom room full of uh, Zen peace builders uh, that I would be attacked 
um, it still um, brings up tension for me. My name is Armand Volkas, and I am Jewish. Well, the, the ish uh, softens it. It's, uh, um, and that's how I would normally introduce myself if somebody asked me what my background was. My name is Armand Volkas, and I am a Jewish American. Um, it's a, um, yeah, I like the hyphenated because uh, they're both true facts, but um, it just feels like um, like I'm on some application you know, that I have to put uh, put this this thing down on paper. Um, je m'appelle Armand Volkas. Je, je suis juif. Well, this brings up my mother's story as a, as a survivor of Auschwitz. Um, and, uh, and French anti-Semitism. She was deported from France. Um, my name is Armand Volkas, and I am Lithuanian. Well, my father was from Lithuania, and, and Jews have been in Lithuania for um, over a thousand years, but I don't feel Lithuanian. The same thing goes for Polish. Um, my mother was born in Poland. Um, so deconstructing uh, identity um, um, helps us uh, uh, draw out, at least in the uh, uh, an exercise done early in a process, either with one group that struggles with, with historical trauma or with two groups in conflict, uh, doing this in front of each other um, uh, opens up uh, a, uh, an investigation uh, through, through emotions, and then it becomes a diving board into other work. So I just wanted to uh, present this exercise You'll see it in one of the clips when I bring Germans, children of Nazis, children of Holocaust survivors together a little bit later. So, okay. So I just wanted to model that because it's best done in at the beginning when I'm before we get to know each other. Um, and um, um, so let me say a little bit about my biography because it really has, uh, it's at the root of why I do this and why I have a need to continue to transform uh, and need to transform my uh, identity and my legacy every day in some form. Um, um, I was born in France. My parents and family immigrated to the United States to Southern California. And uh, I came into consciousness on a chicken farm in Southern California. My father um, uh, raised chickens for eggs. And there were, there happened to be a, uh, many uh, Holocaust survivors uh, in California that ended up um, on chicken farms, uh, egg farms, and uh, you know which um, the irony of 
you know, concentration camp for chickens didn't escape me as a, as a child. My mother was born in Poland. She left Poland to come um, uh, to escape uh, the, the Nazi wave and came to, um, to Paris. And, um, and uh, when the war started, she was pregnant with my half brother um, and uh, uh, escaped to the south of France, to Toulouse, uh, to give birth to my brother in 1940, as the Nazis were marching into France. My, um, and then the Nazis said, oh, it's okay, you can come back, we're safe. You know, we're not gonna hurt you. And so when she came back, the, 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 uh, all of the laws against Jews started to occur. Uh, to, and uh, my um, mother, taking care of my uh, half-brother, uh, joined the resistance, smuggling guns and leaflets, uh, was arrested first by the French police, and um, she jumped from a second-story window to escape. She knew her days as a, a resistance fighter in Paris were numbered. Uh, she gave my brother to a French family to take care of him, and she would come on the weekends to visit him. But that someone in the resistance uh, gave names, and my mother was deported, was uh, first beaten and tortured, and then sent to Auschwitz, where she ended up on Block 10, where they performed uh, sterilization experiments on women, in, including my mother. Um, but she had a friend, there was a, a Czech doctor who told uh, Dr. Mengele and Dr. Klauber that uh, she was uh, performing experiments but only was giving, giving blood tests, which helped save my mother's life and mine for that matter, because I was born after the war, the sterilization didn't work. Um, they were discovered, uh, she was arrested with a group of women and um, they, uh, who helped, they helped each other uh, survive. And um, uh, to make a long story, it's an epic story. I don't, uh, we won't have time if I tell you all the details. Uh, but basically, um, my mother was made uh, to stand naked in the snow uh, with her arms up, along with the other women who had escaped the operation. They were blamed. Uh, this Czech doctor was shot and uh, my mother was sent to forced labor. Um, and uh, so I'll leave my mother's story there. My father um, first uh, was born in Lithuania and um, my, um, when the Spanish Civil War against Franco broke out, uh, he had been in Palestine um, at uh, the time. He organized a group of uh, Jews and Arabs to go uh, to Spain to fight against uh, the dictator Franco. Um, and he fought there for three years, so, uh, the length of the war. Uh, afterwards, he was in a French concentration camp um, and after that, he uh, was repatriated with Lithuania that had been uh, um, taken over by the Soviet Union. And my father volunteered to parachute behind the lines in white Russia uh, to organize resistance. And my father uh, was a partisan for, he, he uh, parachuted. Um, 12 people jumped out of the planes and uh, 10 were shot down in the sky. My father survived and he uh, 
continue to to fight um, until he was arrested and sent to Auschwitz. And in Auschwitz, he joined the underground and he fought um, and well, he didn't fight per se. Um, uh, he organized the plan for two people to escape um, from uh, the camp. They actually did escape. One went to London, the other went to um, a documented case. The other went uh, to Moscow, uh, letting people know what was happening in Auschwitz. But they, um, um, nothing, nothing was done. Um, my father uh, heard, um, both my parents were part of the underground in Auschwitz, and he heard that my mother needed boots. And so he smuggled, risking his life, he smuggled boots to my mother. So they actually met in Auschwitz. And now, after the war, my mother returned to Paris, found my brother alive, and uh, um, my father found out his entire family in Lithuania. Lithuania was wiped out by the Einsatzgruppen. Um, made to dig their own graves and shot. And um, so he was a man without a country. He went to uh, Paris and found my mother. And um, I was born in, in 1951, and we left for the United States in 1954. Um, so what does one do with a legacy like this, uh, in Southern California with the, um, uh, the Beach Boys as, the, um, the score of my childhood movie. So, um, so it was theater that saved my spiritual life. Um, and um, I pursued uh, acting and later uh, directing and went to um, have a Master of Fine Arts degree in, in theater acting from UCLA. And um, it was the tail end of the 60s and uh, early 70s. Um, and experimental theater was, um, was uh, still alive and well. And um, I realized for all my method acting and Shakespeare training that they were uh, preparing me to do um, McDonald's commercials if I was lucky. And that's not why I got involved in the theater. So I uh, joined a, um, a feminist theater company in Los Angeles uh, called Synthaxis. And um, uh, acted in some place there, but got the opportunity to create a direct a theater piece. And instead of directing a scripted piece, it just so happened that the majority of the people in the, in the company happened to be uh, Jewish and many children of Holocaust survivors. So I decided in 1975, to bring these groups together, to bring this group together, and for us to take three months to develop, improvise, and devise a theater piece um, on the legacy of the Holocaust. And um, uh, at a time when Holocaust was a relatively new term to describe uh, the 
um, you know, the uh, extermination of uh, American, of um, Jewish, European Jewry. So um, we went uh, into the um, mountains and we improvised and we immersed ourselves and in, interviewed people from um, uh, survivors who were quite plentiful in including my parents in Los Angeles at the time. And we created this theater piece that um, premiered April 30th, 1976. It got rave reviews from the Los Angeles Times. And um, I realized that, uh, and then people were lining up, uh, up around the block uh, for tickets to this uh, theater piece. And so I realized that theater could have an impact that could be a therapeutic uh, intervention uh, on society. And I think this is uh, where uh, drama therapy um, became um, as a profession became clear to me. I'm going to show you a few minutes of, uh, of clips from a film that was uh, created in 1977 uh, that features my theater company, uh, me telling my story. My parents are involved also. Uh, Susan Sontag is featured in this film as, as well. And it was one of the, uh, the uh, filmmaker, um, Gina Blumenfeld, who, uh, whose father was a survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, um, uh, was the director and producer. Um, and so you're going to see people in their um, early to mid 20s talking about the the theater piece that was created uh and it will culminate with a a um um what we call the train poem uh, um and it'll become clear what that's about to capitalize to use this uh, tremendous resource of german anti-semitism to to attract uh, members into the movement, the very first thing that Hitler ever wrote in 1919 was an anti-Semitic tract calling for the, well, I don't know if you say the death of the Jews, but certainly their expulsion from, uh, from Germany in 1919, when he was a recruit to this burgeoning movement. A, a decision was made to use um, this as, as a way of attracting people as an important feature of the ideology. And, and uh, the only thing that uh, is special, perhaps, about the Nazi phenomenon is that at a certain moment, to continue the policy of uh, rounding up the Jews and killing them, putting them in camps, was very counterproductive from a military point of view, because a lot of personnel was d uh, diverted. and. And uh, when the um, death camps were working at their peak capacity, they, they were a real drain on the economy and on the military effort, and Germany was already starting to lose the war in 1942-43. In and yet the policy was reaffirmed. Certain generals did point out that they could use these trains and trucks and, and personnel. And um, Hitler and other people said, well, even if we lose the war, at least we will have killed all the Jews. What is a what is a Jew growing up now have have to deal with in coming to grips with a positive Jewish identity? They have to deal with the Holocaust. They have to deal with centuries of um, anti-Semitism. Um, they have to deal with um, negative Jewish stereotypes: uh, the Jew being cheap, the Jew being rich, the Jew being wily. Um, they, the Jews sticking together, uh, being feeling superior, all those, all those uh, negative stereotypes. And growing up in an American society, uh, you get those things in very subtle terms. It's not like uh, Europe where 
where anti-Semitism is still right on the surface. It's very subtle, and it's still, but it's still a part of our culture, and we've inherited it from Europe. It's a struggle to overcome the, those things and start feeling positive. A lot of people in my generation don't want to have anything to do with it. Uh, I had a lot of misunderstandings about the passivity of the Jewish people. Uh, they went like sheep. They didn't go like sheep. They fought. Mm -hmm. A lot of people fought. And, and I'll, just one more thing, the brilliance of the Nazis psychologically in how they got the people to do what they wanted. It wasn't a bunch of morons like in the TV war pictures. It was brilliantly done. That's another thing that I understood about the passivity, too, was that it all happened step by step. And putting ourselves in their place, you wouldn't want to believe something like that. Well, they'll just make us go this far. Of course, that's understandable. Well, it's just one more step. And, I mean, there's no way that those people could have thought ahead to, to imagine what it could possibly be. They were led along step by step, and they bought Until it. they had no identity, really, <clears throat> and were so humiliated by the process. And that passivity is a, it was a real central issue, I think, uh, for anybody studying the Holocaust because I feel that the, that the Jews of our generation were sold a bill of goods um, as an excuse for why the Holocaust happened. Uh, I know that in my family I was told the, the Jews were always reasonable and the Jews were always calm and the Jews were always passive and this is why they went like sheep to their deaths. And I grew up believing that, and I grew up conducting my life according to those precepts so that I could fit into the mold of all the Jewish people the way they were supposed to be. And when it finally occurred to me that that's not what happened at all and that history bared out the fact that that is not necessarily what happened, it changed everything for me. Not enough young people come to see survivors. But I find that our audiences oftentimes are made up of, of old-timers who come to to I don't know, reinforce what they already know. The most fulfilling experience for me was when we went on our college tour and when we played to young people, people our age. And I feel that we're not doing this play for the old timers, but for our generation and for the generation who followed us. My mind travels, pulling out jewels, glowing and shining. How I hold them inside this train. Rocky, Rocky. So I am held remembering Mama. 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 My mother telling me stories, telling me, Miriam, how she takes me home from the hospital. And oh. boy, how skinny I am. The, the doctor, doctor, my mother says, the doctor, the doctor doesn't, doesn't know anything. anything. Only a mother knows how to keep her baby warm. Mama, Mama. The train whistling and the trees stretching out, stretching out your arms. Mama. Mama. If only I could jump. If only you could catch me, Mama. Mama. The train rocking, rocking now. Now I am held in your arms, hanging on. I am remembering my mind speeding like the wheels of the train, Mama. Mama. I'm ten years old, Miriam, young birthday girl with ten wish candles. And Daddy takes me out back saying, what, what a big girl, girl you are. And he throws me up in the air like a kite, <laughs> like a wishing flower we used to blow and catch in our hands. Make, Make a wish and never tell. I'm
So this was a theater piece, um, as I said, uh, that uh, had a big impact on the time, uh, at the time. And, um, um, and uh, this led me into the field of drama therapy and, uh, with me coming to, um, uh, to the understanding that that theater could have a, a big social impact. Um, and um, so fast forward, uh, we're run, running out of time and I, I'm sorry it took so long with my personal story. Um, I want to fast forward to um, me facilitating starting to in the I moved to the San Francisco Bay Area that's a long story um they were starting a, a drama therapy program at California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco and um um and where I'm currently a professor um um and um as I became, I started working with children of Holocaust survivors as a therapist and then started to wonder what were the Germans doing with their legacies. Um, and in 1989, um, I put uh, two groups together in a, in a, a studio in Oakland, California um children of nazis children of holocaust survivors and uh, the idea was to create a a larger film and we created what you're going to see is a, a 12 minute uh, pilot um as a fundraising tool um the berlin wall came down so a lot of the the um uh, the money that was um, going to come towards us started to come towards towards the um, uh, towards east, uh, you know, um, um, healing east and west um, uh, Germany. So what you're going to see is, um, I mean, transformation doesn't come in in twelve minutes. Uh, you're going to see uh, a workshop that was was filmed, and this is used as a fundraising tool. But I think you'll get a sense of what the encounter between children of Nazis, children of Holocaust survivors, what that feels like and looks like. It has been said that whenever a Jew meets a German, the millions of dead between them take up a lot of space. What happens when the descendants of the victims meet with the descendants of the guilty? To try to answer this question, drama therapist Armand Volkes brought together six Jewish children of Holocaust survivors and six Germans born after World War II. What I'd like uh, to do is have all the Germans up, and then I'll do one with all the Jews. OK, it's this, this one. It's the end of the war in Buchenwald. So let's have um, let's have uh, Carmen. This is you, this person here. Let's have Karen be this person. Okay, ready, begin. This is really true. I cannot believe. Where am I? Just... In May 1989, in a television studio in Oakland, California. These people participated in an intensive weekend workshop using improvisational theater techniques to explore their family histories, personal experiences, and feelings about the Holocaust. These people were not actors. Most had never met before. And for many, it was the first time that they had aired their private feelings on the subject. Lights out. OK, I'd like for all, all the... Uh, the Jewish people to come up. Okay, and I'm going to have you imagine I'm that you're a drama therapist and an actor and a director. And I've been interested for a long time in uh, 
the idea of bringing Germans and Jews together. I just thought that about the tremendous um, moral and emotional power uh, that could come from the two groups resolving to, to remember this event together. My name is Abe Masliak, and I am a Jew. Okay. I, Lowell Cohen, am a Jew. I am a Jew. I, Wendy Dishman, am a Jew. I am a Jew. Okay. What comes up for you as you say that? Um, feeling separate from other people. Feel separate? Just saying that, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, also, just sadness because that I could just be here on this earth after um, all the attempts to annihilate us um, throughout history. It just feels real powerful. I, Magita Urias, I'm a German. It's just very hard to say I'm a German because I don't sometimes feel like I'm a German because I don't want to be identified with um, uh, what happened in Germany. I, I don't feel it's me. I feel like I have to make a point or something that, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. A point? <sighs> what kind of point do you need to make? I'm a German, and I'm, a not, I'm not a Nazi. It's part of it. Ich, Thomas Michaelis, ich bin ein Deutscher. How does it feel to say it in German? More convincing. <laughs> <laughs> convincing, so you believe it more, or you, you feel better about it? It feels like it's easier to deny the shame part. <laughs> it's easier to de deny the shame. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Hitler began killing the Jews in my dad's town. I found that there are a lot of um, similarities, a sense of burden, a sense of what to do with the legacy, a sense of pain about it, uh, guilt, shame. I mean, a lot, of the, a lot of the emotions are the same, even though our stories are different. One of the most profound experiences as a child of Holocaust survivors for me was, as a, as a very young child, was um, not having grandparents. Well, I found a picture of my uh, grandfather. And all of a sudden, I looked at this guy, and I realized I was turning into looking like him, you know? <laughs> this is my grandfather whom I have not known. The whole week I was, you know, um, thought you have to look for this picture, you have to look for this picture, right? And I didn't do it. And so finally, last night, uh, I got it out of the suitcase and then I know why I didn't want to get it out of it, you know? Because it is this uh, uniform, this clear, this clear identity as a soldier of the Nazi army, you know, that, um, I didn't want to see. This is the troop leader of a young Nazi troop out on morning, morning parade, morning work. This is my father, okay. who has been living in a sewer and uh, comes out early in the morning to steal food and has been caught by this troop. And this troop leader breaks my father's wrists over the curb in this manner. How did it feel to be in, in your role, Carmen? Utterly helpless and a very, very uh, humiliating, mm -hmm. very humiliating. When I was seven years old, I was going to summer camp and I had to get a bathing cap because it was on the list. So my father took me to Newberry's 
and I picked out this white uh, bathing cap and had this pink flower on it and little, had little rubber petals on it. And it smelled really good and new, like rubber chemicals. I don't know, I like the smell <laughs> of it. And I took it home uh, and I showed my mother. I said, look what I got, isn't it beautiful? It's white and it has this pink flower on it. And she took it and she looked at it and she pointed to something and she said, take it back. And it said, made in West Germany. And my father said, it's, you know, it's because of the war. We have to take it back. And don't ask her to talk about it though. German stereotypes, what are the ways that you are seen? Loud. Loud? <laughs> Disciplined. Okay, disciplined. That's a task of my, my generation to do the reconciliation work. And I, I have lots of feelings about what my parents and my grandfather's generation did to the Jews. I feel very ashamed about it. And um, sometimes I feel very angry about still being blamed. I think it's very important for every German to look at this because that's part of our inheritance. This project really means a whole lot to me. My greatest hope is that we can be a model for all people who, who are, in some sense, quote, you know, enemies, to come together and share our humanness. You talk about this while we do this. <laughs> okay, Paul, what's your problem? Well. <laughs> Sometimes I want to kick your little German ass all over the lot. I know, and that pisses me off. <laughs> I know, <laughs> that is, because you know what? Why? I like you a lot, but I think you're a little self-righteous sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you like, lack. I think you lack the ability to surrender sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you know yeah. what? what? <laughs> Guess what? What? <laughs> what? Surrendering to an authority is something. That the Nazis taught, you know. Oh, I don't like that. Like that a lot. Lot. You think sometimes I'm a Nazi, huh? <laughs> you think sometimes I act like a Nazi in class? <laughs> Do you? No, I just think you're a Jew, but you're also pretty German. <laughs> you just. You know, I'm actually willing to let you be in charge. <laughs> you know, just don't hurt me. <laughs> no, I won't. You know, I trust you. Oh, hey, that's all I want. That's all I can ask for. Because very often I think you just don't. And you don't want to. <sighs> you know, that's the hardest part for me. I want to trust. It's very hard to do me. It's very hard to. That's my struggle. Uh, yeah. yeah. And that's the same struggle for me the other way around because I'm paranoid about Jews because I think they don't like me or they don't trust mm. me. So so I don't trust. Yeah. It's a tough standoff, isn't it? Yeah. <sighs> well, you know what? I like you, Uber. <laughs> I like you too, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> This German-Jewish project, it feels like a sense of mission. And at the core of it, I think it's friendship. I really think at the core of, of all of this is friendship because if uh, you're friends with someone, it's much more difficult to dehumanize them. This experimental weekend workshop was the first step in developing a long-range project in theater and film based on the interactions of Germans and Jews. 
The Long Range Project consists of three stages. An intensive six-week drama workshop in which a theater piece will be created, an American and European theater tour, and a documentary film. The film will feature highlights of the workshop process and performances and record the reactions of audiences in post-performance discussions. What is the meaning of the Holocaust to its inheritors? Beyond repeating stories of victims and perpetrators, is it possible to forge a common bond free of prejudice and mistrust? How can we learn from the past? I think uh, looking at the time, there is one, one more clip I'd like to show you and I'm, I'd like to just jump into that because um, it's bringing us a little closer to the present moment. Um, that in uh, 19, uh, in 2002, uh, I believe, or three, um, at Concordia University in Canada, um, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu came, was invited by the Jewish students to speak at, uh, at Concordia. And the, the um, pro-Palestinian uh, Palestinian students and uh, pro-Palestinian students um, reacted uh, strongly to this. And um, uh, between the, the Jewish and the, uh, are you still there? Okay. Um, the, to make a long story short, there, were, there was a lot of violence, which uh, all of Canada was focusing on at the time. Um, and they set up a, a conflict uh, transformation fund. Uh, and uh, I was invited to spend a week with uh, a group of uh, Palestinian and Israeli participants uh, that culminated in a public uh, forum and playback theater performance where um, uh, ultimately Netanyahu was disinvited um, and uh, there was a lot of bad uh, feeling. Um, and so um, playback theater is a trained company of actors and musicians that, who in a public performance, we invite members of the audience to come up on stage, share a personal story from their life, uh, choose the actors to be in their story, and then the stories play back improvisationally. I'm focusing on one story that was told publicly, but there were uh, Palestinian and Israeli participants uh, before and after also shared. Where does your story take place, Rania? I'm actually... Um... I have a lot of stories and I was kind of like resisting coming up. I wanted somebody else to come up and my friend encouraged me. <laughs> but... Uh, so, you, you can also say no if it feels like too much. <clears throat> Actually, it doesn't feel like too much. Kind of, I've been living with this all my life, so yeah. it's okay. I might have one story that... Um, it's a small story, actually, which ex it kind of like came out when um, uh, the mention of an Israeli soldier. Yes. I was in um, in Palestine. I was uh, crossing. How old, how old are you in this story? Um, 31. 31. Mm -hmm. I was um, doing um, research. I was. Um, what kind of research were you doing? I was doing an anthropological research. I was doing my master's and um, I was there for field work. And um, I had uh, used to travel back and forth between the West Bank and Ramallah yes. um, as a Canadian. And um, I was, I was, at that time I was in Gaza, the Gaza Strip, yes. and I was coming back, leaving. Um, had to walk um, from the taxi and to cross to the Israeli side. Yes. Um, 
And as a Canadian, I, um, they, they never allowed me to go into the Palestinian side because I was considered as a VIP. Um, so I... Um, How did you feel when you were in this line? VIP line. It wasn't a line actually, it was like a very short yes. kind of like, you know, yeah. very few people okay. across it and yeah. um, and I, there were two young Israeli soldiers smiling. I had just come out of Gaza. Gaza is not one of the most, you know, like happening of places, very depressing, very sad. Yeah. And that was actually before the Intifada. It was before the Intifada? It was, it was a few months before it. Okay. The most recent Antifada. Yes. Yeah. It was in uh, 2000. Yeah. Okay. Choose somebody to be you in this story. Can I, can you repeat your names, please? Nisha. Marie France. Marie France. Okay. So there's not much happening in Gaza. No. I was yeah. I was there and I had finished my uh, my um, my work and I was leaving and there's these two there are these two smiling Israeli soldiers. Yes, and um, um, I present my passport. Uh, both of them are still smiling. I have a grin on my face. Um, it's very very hot, very warm day. Um, just walked a bit of a distance, and uh, one of them says, "How is your day?" Or how are you? In a very human way? Um, or in a, sar was it a sarcastic way or a human way? It was more of a um, flirtatious way. Flirtatious way. <laughs> okay. And they were kind of like giggling, you know. Uh, I, I guess they could know from my name, you know, who, who where I am from. Yeah. So choose somebody to be the, uh, choose two people to be these two soldiers. Yeah. The two guys. The two guys? <laughs> So, were they so, uh, distinguishable from each other, or is there anything uh, distinct? I, no. No? And so, uh, give them a few, give them a few um, um, qualities so that they can play these, these men. Young. <coughs> young, 18, 19? Young, yes, as in 18, 19. Yeah. Um, a bit childish, a bit... Um, um, taking their kind of like their job so lightly, um, trying kind of to have a good time while, uh, while kind of like uh, checking the, the end so tube, you know. Trying to have a good time while they're, they're doing this. Make, making something serious out of yeah. it, yeah. yeah. Um, my reaction was very aggressive, actually. When yes, I see. When I... Uh, so they were flirting with you, and what, what happened? Well, nothing, I said... Uh, can I use some, like, a word? I, th I think, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I kind of, like, looked at him. I said, um, I said to one of them, I said, I said, it's none of your fucking business. How was my day? Uh, and they were, like, taken by it, you know? Yes. I said, did you finish looking at my passport? I said, oh, we're sorry, we're sorry. We're just, you know, trying to be nice. Uh, I said, are you done? He said, yeah, yeah, you can go. And, and so you crossed. And I crossed, yeah. And this is the end of the story. Yes. So, in this moment, um, say what your anger is about. <coughs> well, first of all, I, I have an issue with soldiers. Yes. In general. And second of all, I, uh, the moment that I um, came into uh, Palestine, Israel, uh, my, my first experience was the soldiers. Yes. And, um, and I wasn't very happy about that. I just, yes. uh, so every, every single time that I crossed, you know, the, board, the, the borders or the, the crossing points, you know, the soldiers were there to remind me of the occupation. Yes. And, um, and that wasn't actually one of the, I had a few other incidents, but this is kind of like just an example yes. of. Um, Any other responses to the? the fact that they were um, the way they behaved? Well, they, their existence bothered me. Their existence bothered me. Yeah. Their, their, the fact that they were taking this job so lightly. Yes. They, they were not aware of, of 
the, the consequences of it or its effect on other people. Or the gravity of it. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to add to the story before I turn it over to the actors? I would, I would probably add the, the immense amount of um, rage that um, I, that was, was 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 carried in that story. Yes. And that I am I am I was proud of myself to stand up yeah. and and express that rage. Yes. Can you choose somebody to be your rage? Nisha. Nisha, sorry. Okay. Um, let's watch. to uh, stop there um, because um, um, what happens, we, you're not going to see the end of the story. Um, I check in with Rania, the, the teller, um, to see if they captured the essence of the rage. And uh, for her, uh, they didn't capture it. And so I propose to her to, to um, if we can do it again, could we show her rage? And the actors this time commit themselves. And she's, uh, uh, she's satisfied that, that the depth of her rage was, um, was shared. Okay. 
So thanks for your patience with my technical skills here. Is, um, why don't we we come back to um, and uh, see um, if there are uh, any other any questions? Um, and uh, there are a lot more uh, applications of this in various contexts um, that obviously we won't have time to get to. So, uh, yeah, Jim. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Armand, for being here today. Um, how soon would you go into an area in conflict before, uh, like, you know, how, how much time does it need before that conflict has become more chronic than acute? I'm not sure if I would. Yeah, I I understand the the question. You know that uh, I think uh, it's um, each. Uh, we talk in drama therapy about uh, distancing, uh, emotional distance. When you're playing back a story, do you um, uh, do it as a puppet show because it's just too charged? Or do you play it back realistically? You know, so there are uh, people who are in, you know, um, I, I did uh, recently um, try to um, had a workshop with Russians and Ukrainians, uh, but most of the Ukrainians didn't show up. Uh, so it's too, that's too, too soon. Um, um, uh, but um, um, I've worked with uh, in Lebanon with the factions uh, that were involved in the um, in the Lebanese civil war, um, and um, that had enough distance, even though it was. Uh, in, um, it's mostly the the parents' generation that experienced the the direct trauma of of the civil war, uh, but they were or they were the participants were were young at the time, um, so it it, uh, it depends on the on the conflict. Uh, yeah, uh, each one has its own amount of uh, emotional or aesthetic distance. That you have to take into consideration. Um, On the same, or the other side of that, how how many generations before you find uh, it it doesn't quite have the same sort of power? So if it's three generations uh, passed down trauma, are you still able to engage with it in this way? Uh, that's a great uh, question. Um, I'm, um, I've tracked, uh, you know, work with the first, second, third, and beginning fourth uh, generation with uh, children of Holocaust survivors and children of Nazi descendants. And it's still, you know, it's still alive at this point. It's harder um, for people to uh, connect with uh, colonialism if it's uh, you know 500 years ago, um, for example, although people, um, the victims of uh, colonialism still feel the impact, and, um, but those uh, far from it historically uh, uh, have a harder time empathizing, uh, standing in the shoes of the other. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, those are great questions. Thank you. Actually, uh, I have got a question. Okay. Uh, one thing uh, is uh, how uh, your approach uh, helps to deal with uh, uh, belated effects of conflict or traumas. But my well, question is whether it can help relieve tensions and conflicts on the spot, like you have shown some uh, 
Palestinian Israeli situation, but uh, can it really have an impact on what's going on uh, in uh, such conflicted situations and among conflicted communities when it happens, not uh, not just to deal with the psychological aftermath? Um, I think drama, obviously we work, drama therapy is not for everyone, or psychodrama, but in, um, um, I call, as I said earlier, I call them, you know, the emotional pioneers who paved the way for others to follow, that obviously I'm not, you know, I'm not so grandiose that I think that my humble tools can uh, create world peace here, that in, uh, although I hold on to that vision, that I think um, the way I've seen it work best is for people um, um, who um, are the emotional pioneers, the people who are willing to be in dialogue, to, to face the demons, to, um, to face, uh, to challenge uh, the obstacles in the way of, of, uh, of peace. Um, I, th I think, uh, they model, you know, that's the reason, the other reason for going to performance, because people lack imagination. Uh, you know, it's hard for them to imagine overcoming the, the emotional blocks uh, to um, a, uh, at least coexistence. Um, and so if you can show the steps involved, or you, you can model it, then then it, it can have an impact. Um, you know, each conflict uh, has a, its own uh, challenges. Um, I think uh, I, after the assassination of Harant Dink in, in uh, an Armenian uh, uh, journalist in Turkey, um, I think, um, there was a, an opening around uh, um, Turkish people uh, recognizing the um, the genocide, and this was it became a, a public event. This was happened at UC Berkeley with the, the Turkish and Armenian students, but you know that. Um, there is um, the Armenian genocide is so invisible. It uh, feels invisible. Uh, that's how the Armenians experience it. But the acknowledgement of the of uh, uh, Turks, you know, made the Armenians weep. They never thought they'd hear an acknowledgement in their lifetime. For example, so each. Each conflict has its own challenges, and uh, so that's one where I felt like it shifted a little, little bit. We made a, a little, uh, a little tiny wave uh, in that direction. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. I have a little question. If it's still, yes. there is still a lot of time. Oh. Yes. Well, first, thank you for, for uh, introducing us to the approach, which is um, uh, beautiful and uh, I think very meaningful. <clears throat> I see um, in, the, in, a, in the first uh, um, documentaries you show, there is uh, uh, the performance is uh, direct. So the, the actors of the performance are the kids of the um, either the perpetrator or the victim, so to say. And in the last performance, there is a little change in the entire setting. So the teller is telling the story, and yeah. then there is a group that is performing the, um, the piece, so to say. And I was asking myself, uh, what's the difference in terms, really like in terms of uh, the, way the body process, processes the trauma 
Yeah. So because yeah, I, I saw in the first. Uh, so if one analyzed the first documentary, I haven't seen it all. So, but you can see really like the body reaction, and um, the response of the body. And in the second, we cannot really see because there is not the teller is not uh, shown in the in the process. But I imagine that there is a completely different result. Is it so, or is it more the story? that changes the perception of the entire process that then provoke or trigger the response to trauma? I didn't completely uh, uh, track your, your question. The question if is the per in the performance is the narrative element, so the story or the storytelling or the somatic, the, 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 the yeah. physical body level, or if yeah. they're both? Um, I think that, um, that this kind of approach is good for changing um, dysfunctional narratives. You know, you've written the story up to this point, and you have an opportunity to change the narrative. So I think that it's, it's really useful in that way and uh, you know and so that's through psychodrama drama therapy or or performance um uh in terms of the the uh trauma that you're holding in the body that's in a in a closed workshop but you know it was interesting um the the german and uh, Jewish uh, child of Holocaust survivors, child of Nazis, uh, the two two men wrestling with each other. Yeah, this is a somatic uh, encounter, and as well as an artistic or improvisation. Um, so, but I think uh, trauma is best done and dealt with direct trauma in a um in a closed psychodrama uh context it's not necessarily um useful as a in for the individual in performance unless it has a unless it has a therapeutic objective uh, thank you else? yeah you're welcome any other uh, comments or um or questions before uh, we move towards closure. I'm just going to take a, a selfish moment to say hello to Manu, Adam, Sandra, and Nilly. We all were at Auschwitz a couple weeks ago um, for for our bearing witness retreat. It's great to see you. Yeah. Good. Thanks for that. <laughs> Yeah, any other questions or comments be, before we close? Yes, Edie. Oh, I think you're muted. Oh, you're still muted, let's see. Uh, Neely, can you unmute? Is it okay now? Yes. Perfect, yeah. First of all, thank you so much. It was very interesting. And I, I feel uh, the same as you as a second generation. And uh, it's a coincidence, of course, like all coincidences are, that I've just uh, finished a year course in, uh, in playback theater in Israel. Oh, great. Okay. And uh, many of my in experiences as a child were performed in front of, of me by my group and it was so therapeutic yeah. it's a wonderful it's a wonderful vehicle device to have a transform a transformation of emotions and thank you again you're welcome Lydia. thank you to my fellow playbacker so yeah
All right, so it uh, looks like we're out of our time now. Um, yeah, you definitely piqued my interest in terms of drama therapy, so we hope to see you back here again, maybe oh. do a workshop with us. Or maybe we can perform for you sometime, so my company, so awesome. performing online. Anyway, thank you, and thank you for uh, for your patience with the technical difficulties. And uh, so, uh, thank you so much for inviting me.